Would you join me in prayer? Lord, your word is food to our souls, nourishment for our lives. As we take this time together to consider your words, Lord Jesus, about the nature of the kingdom of heaven, we pray that your Holy Spirit will open our hearts and minds to the riches of your grace and that we may dwell deeply and receive deeply of your blessing to us in this time. Amen. Well, two years ago, I went to an amazing conference on social enterprise in Halifax at the Atlantic School of Theology. And while I was in Halifax, I managed to have crab, shrimp, lobster, or fish at every single meal because those are not expensive choices there the way that they are here. And whenever I do eat lobster, I remember learning that for a long time, lobster was a nuisance catch, that it was plucked out of the fishing nets and thrown back into the water. The cod was prized. It was caught and dried and salted and shipped back to France and to Britain by the colonists to trade for manufactured goods. Lobster had no value at all except to be used as fertilizer in gardens. Later, in the mid-1800s, with the arrival of uh, canning technology to preserve food, lobster was adopted as cheap nutrition for soldiers, prisoners, the poor, and servants. Civil War soldiers ate lobster all the time as part of their rations. Later, in the early 20th century, people started to travel a lot more and the tourism industry got underway. Visitors to places like Nova Scotia and Maryland discovered the delights of fresh caught and fresh cooked lobster. And that's when lobster became a luxury food for the well-off. And this is the story of the journey of lobster from compost to culinary delight. A story of how you look at something can completely change whether you see something as worthless or valuable, whether you see it as a positive or a negative. Today, we're going to look at yeast and see whether yeast is something positive or something negative. For over these few weeks of this series, we're looking at a group of sayings tucked into Matthew 13. Jesus there plucks images from everyday life to describe the nature of the kingdom of heaven. And we started last week with the tiny mustard seed, which grows into a flourishing and sheltering tree. The mustard seed is a parable that is part of a pear, and the other one is, is today's, the parable of the yeast. And here is what Jesus says about yeast in Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it was worked all through the dough. Bible scholars note that Jesus has here paired these two parables. One, uh, the mustard seed is an agricultural image and therefore from the realm of men. The other is yeast and that's an image from food preparation, the kitchen, which is the realm of women. So Jesus is here capturing the truth that the kingdom of heaven is like yeast stirred into flour. A tiny amount of yeast has a big impact. Yeast is alive. And when yeast is added with water to flour, the flour comes alive too. It changes from being an inert mass to something that is bubbling up and growing and living. A little bit of yeast goes a long way in a batch of flour. Now yeast is very ordinary stuff, something that everyone Jesus was speaking to had access to, everyone knew how to use. And in this parable, Jesus is, is describing a very big batch of dough. It's enough dough to make bread for a hundred people for say a festival or a feast of some kind. It's also the amount of flour that Sarah uses to make uh, the bread that she serves to the visitors who come to her in Abraham and inform her 
of the coming of her long-awaited child. It's also the amount of flour that's described in the instructions for making the showbread, which was part of the uh, work in the temple and was used as a symbol and a sign of God's presence. So Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. Now, the kingdom of heaven can have a relatively small presence and yet have a way out of proportion impact. Like yeast, the kingdom is alive and it can be transformative. It's ordinary and it's every day and yet it can have an extraordinary effect. So here's an example of that. The shoulder to shoulder shop here at the church is a yeasty kingdom of heaven sort of enterprise. It's staffed by a group of regular folks who volunteer their time, their labor, their talent. It's not a huge group, but they have a very big impact. For example, during their bag sale over the last few weeks, many people came to uh, fill up a bag for five dollars. They use the, this clothing to replenish their own wardrobes and I'm sure to pass on to family and friends. And then on the last day of the sale in the gym, all the items were free and people came and loaded up on clothing to be taken to Cuba and to the Philippines to be given away. But that's not all the good that's done at the shop. It is a very green enterprise, diverting items that might otherwise have gone to landfill into reuse. And the cherry on top of the Kingdom of Heaven enterprise is that sales from the shop provide financial support for various projects at the church. So just like yeast, this is a little project that exerts a lively and even transformative and certainly outsized influence. This is the sort of thing that Jesus is describing when he says that the kingdom of heaven is like yeast, mixed in flour, worked all through the dough. So this is a big shout out for yeast as a positive affirmation. So then what do we make about Jesus being so negative about yeast in the scripture passage we heard today? Here Jesus is not praising yeast. He's warning against yeast saying, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, be on guard against this. Because that yeast of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. Now, to be fair, yeast in the Bible is generally viewed in a negative way. Think about the story of Passover when the children of Israel flee slavery in Egypt and start their journey to the promised land. The bread they prepare for their journey was unleavened bread. No yeast, because the bread had to be made in haste. There was no time to wait for it to rise. And right to this day, when Passover is celebrated, only unleavened bread is used. When Jesus celebrated Passover with his friends at what we describe as the Last Supper, he gave them a new commandment. Jesus took the unleavened bread, he broke it, and said, this is my body broken for you. And then he took the cup of wine and said, this is my blood poured out for you. Unleavened bread is perceived as being more holy, more suitable for these holy meals because it is purer. Leaven, leavens like yeast, are seen as something that alters, changes, adulterates, corrupts the flour. Yeast gets into things and transforms them. And in the Jewish religious law, it's all about keeping things safely separated, the pure separated from the impure, the holy separated from the unholy. And yeast is perceived as negative because it gets into things and mixes them up and breaks down the separation, alters and adulterates. And I suppose that's why Jesus uses yeast as an image for corruption when he says, be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now we know how Jesus was in constant and ever escalating conflict with the Pharisees, those religious teachers and enforcers of the law who were appalled by the approach Jesus took to the religious law. The Pharisees wanted strict adherence to the law in every detail, 
And yet here we have Jesus saying things like, I know, I know the Sabbath, we never do any work on the Sabbath. That's the law. But my friends here, they're, they're hungry. And as we walk, sure, they picked up some grains uh, to eat. That's breaking the law, fulfilling work. But don't you realize that we weren't made for the Sabbath? Rather, the Sabbath, these laws are given for us to bless us for our sakes. So Jesus warns his disciples and us to be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, the kind of hypocrisy that distorts the law of God and takes what is intended to be God's blessing to us and perverts it so that the law becomes not a blessing, but instead a rod to beat people with, to feel superior over, using God's word to hurt and not to heal. So we've got these contradictory images here. So which is it, Jesus? Is yeast a positive force? An image for the kingdom of heaven getting mixed into the world lively and transformative, creating an outside impact, feeding growth and vitality, uncontainable bursting boundaries, or is yeast negative? Is it unclean and corrupting and adulterating making changes and getting in where it shouldn't be so that it makes the pure impure and the clean unclean. Is yeast positive or is, is yeast negative? And Jesus uses this example of yeast as an example both of the positive and of the negative. And you know, I think that's kind of like real life. And if the parables are anything at all, they are real life. They are images that are drawn from the ordinary everydayness of life to help us discern the kingdom of God. And in real life, well, most everything is like yeast. It can be a positive source for good and a negative source of spreading corruption. In real life, Hardly ever is anything completely black or completely white. We operate in infinite shades of gray. Making decisions when everything is clear and straightforward sounds great, but really, how often is life actually like that? And I think Jesus, by using yeast as both a negative and a positive image, Jesus is showing us that life is complex and discerning can be challenging. So to raise a timely example, think about right now all the households with school-aged children and the debates going on within those houses. When school opens, will we send our children to school? It's true that distance learning has real limitations. It's true that parents struggle to support their kids' learning and yet getting done all of their other jobs and tasks. It's true that there isn't a vaccine yet for COVID and there is risk of infection. It's true the children are really missing their friends and their social interactions. It's true that parents need kids to be in school so that they can go to work. It's true that not every home is a place of security and stability and that for some children, school is a haven. It's true that schools can't be expected to provide hand washing and distancing monitoring the way that it can be done at home. It's true that Niagara is doing really well with COVID cases. And it's true that every single infection is a concern. All of these debate, debate points and many others are all true. There is no clear, immediate, straightforward solution. Life is complex. Discerning is challenging. And I suppose that's why for believers, prayer and discernment line up so perfectly. When we pray, when the way forward isn't clear, when we have to discern, then we have to put our confidence in our Heavenly Father's presence and his provision of guidance to us. For he loves us, loves all of us and each one of us, so that he numbers even the very hairs on our heads. Now, isn't that such a striking image that Jesus chooses 
to describe how deep and dependable God's love is. Because, well, let's face it, hair is impermanent. We change our hair at a whim, lop it all off or let it grow wild and free. We perm it, dye it, frizz it, straighten it, braid it, roll it, you name it. It really is hair today and gone tomorrow. And maybe that's exactly why Jesus chooses this image, the image of the hairs on our head, precisely because hair is unchangeable and impermanent, and sometimes it just disappears of its own accord. That is such a contrast to our Father's love and care for us, which never changes and is reliably permanent and durable. When we pray, when things aren't black and white, when we have to discern, we are putting our trust in Jesus who loves us and gives his life for us. Jesus reminds us that our worth in God's eyes, he uses the image of the sparrow, the most plentiful and common bird in the world, not known for beautiful colors or glorious song. In Jesus' day, sparrows were actually sold to the poorest of the poor to make their sacrifices in the temple. The richest sacrifices on the altar, oxen or bullocks, were from the richest donors. A little down the scale, we have people who could afford to sacrifice a goat or, or a lamb. For the poor, they would sacrifice maybe a, a pair of doves or pigeons. But for the temple sacrifices made by the poorest of the poor, Four sparrows were sold for a couple of copper coins with one free one, the fifth one, thrown in. And it is this little extra bird, the number five bird, that Jesus is referring to when he says, and not one of them is forgotten before God. You are never forgotten. You can trust that when you bring in prayer, your dilemmas and your decisions, you are remembered. You are never forgotten. The Holy Spirit will hear your groans and turn them into words. The Holy Spirit teaches us all things and reminds us of everything. Jesus says to us that this is so, for lo, he is with us to the very end of the age. Life, decision-making are complex, rarely black and white. It's a lot like yeast. Depends how you look at it and what the circumstances are. So as we live faithfully, as faithfully as we can, as we face up to the challenging realities in our lives, as we prayerfully weigh up our decisions, may God grant us all discernment and the wisdom to abide in his love and take refuge in his care. Amen. Would you pray with me? Jesus, your abiding presence, we rely on it every moment of every day. We turn to you on our own or with others, and you always satisfy. You never leave us bereft. We thank you for this and all your goodness, all your mercy, all your grace, all poured out on us. We thank you. We receive in gratitude and in Jesus' name, amen.